May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be holy and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Y'all catch that Old Testament reading? If a prophet speaks a word I have not commanded, surely that one will die. I kind of feel like sitting down this morning, not saying much. There are all these voices in the first chapter of Mark's gospel, if we have the ears to hear them. There is the voice of the prophet, John the baptizer, crying in the wilderness, repent and prepare the way for the Lord. There was the voice from heaven after Jesus' baptism, you are my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus goes into the wilderness where he is tempted by Satan, more voices. Then Jesus' voice, follow me, he says, follow me as he calls the first disciples. But notice something about all these different voices. They're all coming from the edge. John's prophetic voice in the wilderness, God's voice outside city limits at Jesus' baptism, Jesus' voice on the edge of the shore of Galilee calling his disciples. It's like there's this kind of waiting on the very edge of preparation before making those first steps away from the edge. And now we begin to see Jesus and the voices move from the edge to the center of town as he and his small ragtag group of disciples enter the synagogue in Capernaum. It was not unlike any other synagogue, a gathering place for the locals, a place where the people would come hear the scriptures read, they would pray, they would hear a lesson, no grandiose music, no unnecessary displays of emotion. The right one, 8 a.m. crowd would have loved it. But it is the public sacred space, the center of small town Jewish culture where the voices and the people move from the edge to the very center. But it's also somebody's turf, the scribes, those keepers of the law. And they would stand before the gathered and they'd quote from their former teachers of the law. They would also pass judgments according to how they interpreted the law in all manners of life. And this is the place, this is the very place Jesus chooses to step into, the center of town, which also happens to be scribal territory. Coincidence? I don't think so. See, Jesus didn't come into conflict with the authorities because he was just a really nice guy who was misunderstood. I tend to think that everything Jesus did was intentional. They were astounded at his teaching, is what Mark writes. They were astounded, blown away, for he taught them as one having authority, not like the scribes. That word authority, in in the Greek, It's exousia, exousia, and it means, and listen to this, out of his being, out of his being. In other words, to hear him was to be unable to distinguish the teaching from the man. He did not teach out of this inflated sense of ego due to education or position. He wasn't confined by the house of quotations. He taught out of his very being, out of the center of who he was. And just as Jesus and his voice moved from the edges to the center of town, so he taught from the edges of the mind to the very center of his heart. And when that happens, when that kind of teaching occurs, it's bound to cause some trouble, to stir things up. And it did. Because we hear another voice one of pain and hopelessness and despair, another voice coming to us from the very edge, a man with an unclean spirit. So here we come to the exorcism part, a part of the story that might make many of us Episcopalians a little uncomfortable. We consider ourselves a rational and reasonable expression of the Christian faith. We tend to shy away from things like this 
We shy away from such talk of unclean spirits and exorcisms. But the bottom line is, no matter how uncomfortable it might make us, no matter how shaped we are by modern theories of psychology and science and medicine, those in the ancient world had no problem speaking of spirits and exorcisms. And here's the thing. Jesus heals this man. He heals this man, this man who is deeply disturbed with this unclean spirit. He heals him. Now, this is important. Jesus isn't curing a disease. He's healing an illness. He's not curing a disease. He's healing an illness. New Testament scholar Jay Pilch helps us understand the distinction And he uses these two terms, biomedicine and ethnomedicine. Biomedicine, we're familiar with that. It dominates contemporary medical discussions. It's concerned with how diseases affect an individual and the treatments of those individuals. Ethnomedicine, maybe we're not so familiar with that. It's about how a culture or a society understands illness and how that illness shapes our perceptions, how illness affects others, the family, the block, the neighborhood, the community, the city. In the time of this gospel story, all illness excluded you from community. Spiritual significance was attached to it. One was considered impure, sinful even, and you were cast to the very edge of society. And guess who allowed you to come back into the fold? Guess who was responsible for deeming you fit for community life again? The scribes. The unclean spirit that afflicted this disturbed man was the disease. His exclusion from the life of the community was the illness. So maybe we don't need to get hung up on all the supernatural language of this story. Maybe the miraculous here isn't what Mark's primary point is. Maybe it's more about what Ched Myers calls Jesus' symbolic action. Because when Jesus heals this man, he's not just curing an individual of a disease, he's beginning his work of healing a society from the illness of excluding those cast to the edges. It's a healing that moves people from the edges of despair back into the center of community. Today we are in no shortage of unclean spirits, to use the language of our gospel story. They may not take the shape and form of a man convulsing on the ground as it did in this story, but they take other forms, depression, and substance abuse, and alcoholism, and suicidal thoughts. And I'm sure many of you have come across articles recently, an epidemic that is swept across our culture. Loneliness. And that list could go on and on. And despite so many needed and wonderful advances in science and medicine that expand our understanding of these things, the illness of exclusion... The illness of exclusion still exists. See, Christianity is not having, it's not about having a a perfect house with two nice cars in the driveway with your perfect kids and your perfect marriage. Christianity is about learning to love like Jesus. It's a love that takes us into the deepest joys and and sorrows of our own and other people's lives. It's a love that moves us and those around us from the very edges and returns us to the center because sometimes we have to go to the edges to find the center. But when we do that, when we let Jesus enter into the sacred spaces of our lives, like he entered that synagogue that day in Capernaum, not only will we be astonished at his teaching, not only will we recognize his authority, his being, intertwining with our very being in our lives, we will also see those unclean spirits. We'll get to catch glimpses of them 
get out of people's lives. And we'll begin to see our community move toward healing. And I think that's an exorcism even we Episcopalians can talk about. Amen.